So before we get started, um, some Zoom logistics. Today's event will run for about one hour. We are recording it and we will send out an email usually within 48 hours after the event to send you the recording. It will be posted on World Beyond Wars YouTube channel. Please do use the chat box throughout the event to introduce yourself, to post any comments and have discussions. We also do have the Q&A box enabled. So when we get to the Q&A portion of the, of the event, please do put your questions specifically in the Q&A box and I can read those out. We do have closed captions enabled for today's event. You can click on the CC live transcript button to enable the Zoom captions. If you don't see that button, sometimes you have to click on the three dots in the bottom right of your Zoom screen to see more options, and then you'll see the captions. And the captions are done by robot, so please excuse any errors with the transcription. Um, and with that, I want to pass it over to Larry Gilbert, who is a coordinator of the World Beyond War Florida chapter, and Larry will introduce today's event. So go ahead, Larry. Hello, everyone. And I want to welcome you to this uh, webinar, Full Spectrum Dominance, uh, being presented by Lisa Savage. And Lisa is an anti-war activist, organizer, blogger, and retired teacher from Maine, right here where I'm at in Maine. Uh, in 2020, she ran for the US Senate and earned 5% of the votes following a strong performance in four televised debates where she shared an anti-imperialist analysis of US foreign policy and domestic priorities. She founded the Maine Natural Guard, that's natural, Maine Natural Guard, where many have taken the pledge to point out the enormous role of the US military in driving climate crisis. She was co-coordinator of the national Bring Our War Dollars Home campaign, pointing out the bad budget priorities of the US Congress. Her articles and op-eds on militarism have been published in Common Dreams and Counterpunch. In 2022, she became a social media coordinator for the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space on Twitter, on Twitter and Instagram. And she blogs uh, at HTTP and uh, went to the bridge.substack.com. So, uh, Greta told me she was going to put it in the chat, so uh, look for it in the chat. So without any further ado, it's my great pleasure to present Lisa Savage. Thank you, Larry. Thank you for that nice introduction, and thank you, Greta, for all your work to set up this webinar. Thank you to everyone who's joined us this evening. Um, but Larry didn't mention that I'm the world's oldest social media manager. Um, the global network uh, it does uh, let me run a couple of their social media accounts. And um, as you can see, I'm not the usual age of people that do that. I'm also a retired teacher. I taught for many years here in central Maine. Um, this presentation was developed for the annual meeting of the global network against uh, weapons and nuclear power in space and, and that I gave toward the end of summer, this past summer, and it's been adapted uh, for today but that's the origin of these uh, thoughts about full spectrum dominance. So thanks for being with us. And I'm gonna get started sharing my screen here. Let's hope all goes well. Let's see. Everybody see that okay? Mm. Yep, looks great. Yeah. Great. So full spectrum dominance is a phrase uh, that the Pentagon uh, coined, and it's kind of an oxymoron if you think about the fact that full spectrum implies rainbows and good things and uh, good lighting and that sort of stuff. Uh, dominance is a very military word and a violent word. Um, so when you put them together, uh, they don't really go together. And it's quite ironic in the year 2023 that the Pentagon would still be pursuing uh, a pipe dream of full spectrum dominance. I'll explain what 
I used to think that meant, and then based on some more research, what I came to believe uh, that it meant, in part, it represents the U.S. sort of treating all its allies like vassals. Um, and the U.S. is the big dog, and they tell people what to do, and if they want to bomb your pipeline, they'll bomb your pipeline. Um, I, you know, a kind of a contrast that's happened here just this uh, recently, in the last few days, is on October 12th, all the um, Arab uh, ambassadors in Beijing met with the foreign minister and um, to discuss how to get humanitarian aid into Gaza and how to affect a ceasefire uh, to protect the civilians that are dying. Uh, and, and Biden went to meet with the Prime Minister Netanyahu. So... You know, that's a sort of reflective of where the world is trending right now and why full spectrum dominance is uh, an aspirational goal, but I don't believe it will it will ever be reached. Um, you know, vassalization has come to the fore recently, of course, because of NATO's war on Russia in Ukraine. And, um, you know, seeing the U.S. and NATO bomb a, a gas pipeline that didn't belong to them, uh, but belonged to one of a NATO ally, Germany, was was shocking to many of us. Um, and, uh, you know, sending depleted uranium and, and cluster bombs to be used in Europe. Um, these are the acts of, of, of to uh, ethics or international law, um, you know, might makes right. And so that is the idea behind full spectrum dominance. Really, the constant exploitation of indigenous peoples' uh, homelands around the planet was a ramp up to full spectrum dominance. And um, also, the ascendance of finance as a, um, a means of control over in an in a economic um, activity, even over manufacturing or farming, um, the commodification of the commons, which all life depends on. These are all sort of enablers of full spectrum dominance. And needless to say, the 800 or so military outposts that uh, in other people's countries that the US maintains um, project full spectrum dominance. And the petroleum based dollar has been very much an instrument of full spectrum dominance. And that also is. Uh, kind of coming unglued. Finally, I would say an introduction, the imprisonment of Julian Assange, as some argue, the imprisonment of journalism in itself, Caitlin Johnstone, the Australian blogger said this week, is essential to maintaining full spectrum dominance because no one can be seen to have the right to criticize the world's biggest or, or question uh, their decisions. See here, how do I get to my next slide though? I'm screen sharing, but let's see. Sorry. Let's see. I need to go to uh Greta help me. Sometimes out if here, you I just can't. click your right arrow key to move to the next slide. Oh, okay, good. I thought I did that and it didn't work, but here we go. Um in 2015, the Pentagon's vision of full spectrum dominance looked a lot like this infographic. Um, naturally, this realizing that vision was going to require outposts all over the globe. And um, some warped thinkers among you might have thought that cooperation and collaboration would have been more useful responses to the need to think globally. But, uh, you know, perhaps teaming up to mitigate the effects of climate change, in part caused by all these spacecrafts and warplanes zooming around dominating. Um, but unfortunately, the hubris of Space Force was just waiting in the wings until the Trump administration. Uh, America's military space operations had previously been under the Air Force. And really, NASA essentially is a military program in effect, although they would uh, deny it, I think. But um, now that we have an actual space force, um, we actually have, you know, uniforms resembling costumes. Well, I'm just, I'm reading this from the Washington Post. The uniforms resemble costumes from the television series Battlestar Galactica, and the logo is right out of Star Trek, and even the name it gives its members, Guardians, seems born of science fiction. 
So that was established as the sixth branch, branch of the armed forces. And their motto was Sempra Supra, or always above. Uh, obviously, um, Ukraine is really the first war where uh, satellite communications have been really key to the operations um, of the military. And the Pentagon has been preparing for this for a very long time. Um, the next slide uh, could be called the high speed kill web because it not only includes uh, the uh, out outer space and the air directly above the earth, but it includes the world's oceans, which have been um, scattered with sensors and um, a, a whole network of things that are very harmful to marine life, but enable the uh, satellites that are way above us to uh, communicate with the satellites down in the ocean or the sensors in the ocean. And, uh, you know, this is the full spectrum dominance of all realms, turning everything into um, a military um, kill web, so to speak. Zooming forward from the 2015 plans for full spectrum dominance, we um, now are in a situation where uh, we, you know, have the um, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, confessing that the reason that the U.S. dipped into its reserve of cluster munitions was that it didn't have run out of ammunition to send to Ukraine. The, the shelves were, were empty at the moment. So this is what we're going to do uh, as a stopgap until production ramps up again. Um, you know, aside from how you might feel about those things, is this is this really the admission of someone, the, a, a military entity that can dominate the planet? But oh, we ran out of ammunition. We we're gonna give you the old stuff from you know. Uh, another part, a very important part of full spectrum dominance is information control. And we know that when uh, President Obama was in office, he signed a sort of 11th hour uh, bill right at the end of his second um, term that, that permitting US tax dollars to be used to create propaganda for domestic consumption. This had been illegal before, it was probably done anyway, but um, this was a, a huge leap forward for the full spectrum dominance um, you know, a branch of information control. One of the things that we notice here on one of the Democratic Party's favorite um, media sources, Politico, actually has its national, they have a daily national security bulletin that you can subscribe to and get in your inbox. It's actually sponsored by Lockheed Martin, one of the biggest, um, you know, uh, corporate profiteers off endless wars. Um, how could you possibly be getting information uh, from Lockheed Martin that was uh, journalism as we knew it? Um, you know, and and their uh, mission statement here that we see on the screen is, is they don't say the words full spectrum dominance, but that's clearly um, what they're talking about. Another development that's been very interesting in recent times is uh, when Elon Musk, whatever we think of him and whatever we think of his uh, SpaceX and um, his satellite clusters, uh, did when he bought the uh, Twitter, he opened up their internal communications prior to the purchase and let several journalists sift through it to see what they could make of it. And these are sort of colloquially known as the Twitter file. So uh, what it revealed was pretty shocking to me and probably to many of you. And that was that government officials had been constantly pressuring Twitter managers to censor unwelcome views, even if they were factually correct. And this has emerged in the um, geopolitical realm, but it also uh, very early on emerged uh, during the pandemic in um, you know, suppressing information about uh, the uh, COVID-19 vaccine that was factually true, but government officials were telling Twitter, but that might create vaccine hesitancy. So we need you to, you know, de, uh, push push these this kind of information down in your algorithms so that uh, the 
public doesn't see it and, and be influenced by it. Many, many branches of the federal government were involved in doing this daily. So again, this is your tax dollars and mine paying government employees to pressure privately owned social media platforms to um, cut the truth to fit the government's um, goals at that moment, uh, which is you know a pretty shocking revelation. Uh, as, as the Ukraine war um, moved into the phase where Russia's special military operation ramped things up quite a bit in an ongoing civil war that had been happening at least since 2014, uh, narrative control about that war became um, super important to our government. And um, so many of us that have been opposed to every war, and I'm already against the next war, as we say, were shocked at the level and the um, intensity of narrative control around this particular war um, that the U.S. was waging by proxy through Ukraine. We've been disagreed with lots of times, you know, going back, all the way back to Vietnam, or for some of you before that, the Vietnam War. But um, Never had I been told so vociferously I don't have you that I did not have the right to speak my mind and say my opinion about this particular war. Um, it wasn't just that we disagree with you; it was that you must be silenced. That's a new phase for information control um, in the hands of the federal government, for sure. Um, today's kind of an interesting day because uh, the. Um, document known as the Westminster Declaration was published today. It was signed by 138 scholars, journalists, and public intellectuals, including Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, Chris Hedges, and many other names you would recognize. And it's a pretty international group as well. Um, they are warning the public of what they call, with, cap with initial caps, the censorship industrial complex and they are urging governments to dismantle this structure that I was just referring to uh, in, just in terms of Twitter and uphold the first liberty, uh, which they are saying is freedom of speech. So uh, you may wanna take a look at that document. I think you can see it online at uh, westminsterdeclaration.org. I uh, perused it quickly before tonight's webinar, but that's an interesting development. And, uh, this aspect of information control. Um, in July, a judge prohibited several federal agencies and officials uh, from doing uh, what I have just been describing, which is um, working with social media companies uh, around protected speech. We, all of us on this webinar would know that the First Amendment guarantees our right to uh, political speech and um, that uh, the federal government involving itself with means of communication and saying these thoughts are, are forbidden, these words are not to be said, and, and so forth, is, um, well, something that at least some courts and some judges don't think is constitutional. So um, the White House has, uh, immediately upon the ruling, the White House reportedly canceled a meeting with Facebook executives. Um, I just took Twitter as an example. All the social media platforms, the big ones, um, have been in collusion with the federal government for several years now, controlling what we see and what we don't see. During the recent unrest in France, the government turned off the internet there and shut down several social media platforms. So um, this also is an expression of the kind of total information control that uh, our imperial managers think they can pull off. I don't think they can, but they're going to try every method they can think of. You know, kind of the roots of this kind of thinking um, are contained at the end of World War II uh, in more contemporary times, we have uh, John Bolton, an advisor to several um, ad administrations, saying that if he were doing the Security Council at the end of World War II, he'd just have one member because the U.S. is, um, you know, the only real power that counts. 
and any international laws are invalid uh, if they're trying to constrict American power. So this is like hubris on steroids here. And um, But one of the things that I uh, found real interesting that I was reading about last year, I read Diana Johnstone's um, memoir, Circle in the Darkness, and it was really interesting. And one of the things she wrote about was the meeting between Truman and Stalin in Potsdam uh, when they got the news that uh, it was time, but that the test of the atomic bomb in New Mexico had, had been a successful. And it, she writes, observers recall that Truman was a changed man, euphoric with the possession of such power. And while more profound men shuddered at the implications of the destructive force to Truman and his conniving Secretary of State James Burns, the message was, now we can get away with everything. So I think this explains the crazy thought that you could achieve full spectrum dominance um, at the end of World War II when the US was the only power known to have nuclear weapons. And certainly we are the only nation ever to have used nuclear weapons on civilian populations. Um, but now the, the US and more broadly the West um, are trying to dominate cyberspace, outer space, uh, the world economy, and um, you know they're going to continue. People like Bolton are going to continue talking to themselves about American exceptionalism. Well, I was a history uh, student of history in my youth, and um, it, it seems to me that every empire that I ever studied um, went right down to the to, to their grave, saying, "But we are mighty, and we are you know wonderful, and the imperial we, our imperial ar ar arrogance it's, it it never seems to." Uh, take a reality check and say, well, maybe we were at the end of World War II, but hey, you know, this is decades later, things have changed and so forth. Is the full spectrum dominance mindset more dangerous as it becomes less and less possible to actually achieve it? I think we're seeing evidence of that now. You know, nuclear weapon use was once unthinkable, but the corporate press is now full of things like how to survive a nuclear war. And you know we're closer to doomsday than ever. Um, talking about using tactical nuclear weapons, as if uh, a nuclear a use of nuclear weapon in today's world, with so many nations having nuclear weapons, could be contained to one little tactical. You know, and probably by now you've all seen the um, the video that the uh, Department of um, Emergency Management in New York City put out with this. Uh, a talking head person telling how to survive a nuclear attack on New York City. You know, you're supposed to roll up towels and stuff them under the, the door to keep. It's just absurd. Those of us who grew up climbing under our school desks during drills about how we were going to survive um, a nuclear attack. I remember as a child in Los Angeles being told, and don't look toward the windows because the, the flash of light might hurt your eyes. Well, if a nuclear bomb is dropping on Los Angeles, I, I might, you know, it seemed absurd to me even as a 10 year old. And um, we're right back there again, seemingly having made no progress. Um, recent developments in full spectrum dominance include um, DARPA, which is an acronym for the US Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And they had a um, a project uh, in that agency called Total Information Awareness. Um, this is uh, based on the idea that artificial intelligence would allow people or allow agencies, allow nations to um, have access to so much information and be able to meaningfully sift through it and draw some conclusions. Um, you know, one of the suggestions is that there is so much data collected now that really it's far beyond human beings' ability to make sense of it. But then it all becomes dependent on, well, how good are your algorithms? Are your algorithms looking for the things that you want to look for and find? Or are they really going to discover you know, what's in that data that might be useful for your decision-making? 
as soon as an empire stops getting real information and, and goes down the path of wishful thinking, it seems to me they become much more dangerous because they can't make decisions based on their own self-preservation at that point. You know, they're telling themselves stories and believing them. Um, a, a fun fact about DARPA is the day that DARPA ended, Facebook began. And there's strong evidence that all the social media platforms that we use were essentially developed for Pentagon use and then, you know, uh, passed on to the public. But, you know, it's more palatable to the public because they have a false separation from the defense sector. Very few people understand how closely connected um, these things are just in the technology that that you know gave rise to them, the the actual development of those apps, if you will. It's clear that the managers who work for social media companies are pretty much all CIA, NSA, or Pentagon um, alumni, and that has also been the case for quite a long time now. This is a very recent infographic that I have to confess I have not fully digested at all. It came from um, the Watson Institute at Brown University's Cost of War Project. It's probably many of us on the call are familiar with this project. Um, and we, uh, they did a great, um, let, let's see, their actual, the actual, I don't know, I'm not finding what their actual, Mass Surveillance is the title of this a white paper that's been published on their website, the Cost of War website. Um, there's an executive summary for those of us not inclined to wade through the whole long um, paper, but it looks like a very, very interesting document, and I know I will be perusing it more closely. This infographic is an attempt to show just how interconnected the um, web of taxpayer funded agencies and governments, um, private corporations that profit from uh, harvesting our data and reselling it. Um, and then, um, you know, other kinds of uh, surveillance technologies and techniques that web this all together so that um, it's a, it can be a comprehensive um, way to dominate the um, information sphere. And you can see several federal agencies listed there, the FBI, the Department of Homeland Security, the Defense Intelligence Agency, which is within the Pentagon, um, and, and several others. I have to tell you that when I was teaching high school, maybe 10, 12 years ago, um, and we uh, watched the documentary about Edward Snowden's narrow escape from having revealed um, that all the big telecoms were spying on all Americans and turning it over to the federal government. The high school students uh, enjoyed the film and had we had a good discussion, but they said, no offense, but like, what was the big deal about what Edward Snowden showed? And I said, well, that all the big telecoms were spying on everyone. And these were like mm, see, uh, juniors and seniors in high school. They were like, duh, like, guys didn't know that. I could tell it was kind of an okay boomer moment in their heads, like, oh my gosh, she's so naive. She thinks that wasn't happening already. But for people of my generation, we did not think that the federal government was entitled to our private communications. Remember when the U.S. Post Office uh, mail was kind of sacrosanct? You didn't open mail. You had to have a warrant to tap someone's phone or open someone's mail. That has long since Cease to be the case as everything has gotten digitized. Um, all those barriers that used to exist, even the psychological barriers of thinking this is wrong, uh, have kind of melted away under the onslaught of way too much data and AI algorithms sorting through it for us. Some of the um, full spectrum dominance aspects of this, you know, war in cyberspace are that of course the US and its you know threat who it perceives as its enemies the threat of the chinese and the 
and, and Russia, they're always trying to um, interfere with each other's cyber communications. And um, unfortunately, uh, the U.S. had, uh, I saw this report um, this summer, the U.S. had planned and was building an electronic jamming device to combat the um, satellite communications that the, these two other nations use to inform their movements and talk to their armies in the field and so forth. But it didn't get done uh, it was delivery. It was due for delivery last year, but it might come in 2024 at the earliest. This, to me, is reminiscent of the fact that many nations at this point have developed hypersonic weapons. Um, the U.S. has not been able to develop hypersonic weapons, although two different military-industrial contractors have been given huge sums of tax dollars to develop uh, such weapons, but. Um, the technology has not come to fruition yet. And I this always makes me question, maybe a for-profit military industrial complex isn't actually competitive. Maybe putting that profit motive in there makes for um, less than efficient and effective development of technologies. Um, that the military thinks are really important. So this is another example in my um, opinion of the hubris of full spectrum dominance. Like, you know what, guys, you're falling behind on the on the science stuff and it's getting worse, um, not better. One of the things as an educator that I always used to think about was, well, you know, science and math education in my neck of the woods in rural, uh, you know, very low income Maine is pretty dismal. Um, the kids that are uh, really good at math go to a magnet school um, in their high school, later high school years to study science and math at the level that you would need to develop, you know, th this kind of technology. But, you know, the countries that the U.S. thinks they're going to full spectrum dominate have merit-based education systems that are looking for talent very, very young. Um, and, and making sure that that young people have access to really high levels of mathematics education uh, so that they can um, develop the talent that's there. And uh, I think that the, you know, the United States has fall, fallen further and further from a meritocracy during my lifetime, uh, such, such that even the most, um, you know, selective of the big um, Ivy League educational institutions and so forth are full of legacy kids and nepotism and, you know, students whose parents bought their way into the college because they were going to build a uh, some kind of a building for them. And, um, you know, you can do that. It's an elite system of education and you certainly can build that. And that is what we have built. But the, you know, the people that the full spectrum dominance seeks to dominate have not done so. They have followed other strategies. So um, the, or this was uh, early in July, we saw a report that um, Russia had managed to hack into Ukraine's um, draft uh, conscription database and, and mess with it. Um, you know, hacking goes on constantly back and forth. I'm sure much of it we don't hear about or it's not reported. Um, but definitely, you know, the edu the information realm is where modern warfare is waged and uh, cyberspace is also very much where modern warfare is waged. We've seen the importance of, you know, a private contractor, Elon Musk and his satellite network um, has been you know, repeatedly during the war in Ukraine called on to, oh, turn on, we turn it on for Crimea. And then, oh, you you wouldn't turn it on for Crimea, you're a traitor. And whatever we think, whether we agree with that point of view or not, it uh, puts the U.S. on a rather on the back foot to be dependent on oligarchs, billionaires who don't have to do what the Pentagon says. And the Pentagon can't really make them because you know, they don't own the technology. They they are not the ones. The Pentagon hasn't launched tens of thousands of low Earth orbit satellites like SpaceX has. So they just don't have the infrastructure or the know-how to be able to 
uh, you know, dominate um, a company like SpaceX. Um, I had a note here about the um, Vilnius NATO uh, summit that happened when I was preparing this originally. And uh, we talked a little bit about running out of ammunition, but, um, you know, many uh, critics and analysts said that summit was the end of NATO's reign. NATO may still exist, but that was the meeting where it started to come unglued and it became obvious that the U.S. can't just call the shots anymore, that there are, you know, there, uh, there's a lot of, well, if you just look at the way Turkey has conducted itself, supposedly a NATO member, um, and uh, Turkey's done lots of things during this proxy war in Ukraine that the U.S. didn't approve of, didn't like, um, and and didn't want them to do, but they they just don't have that kind of control over the group anymore. One of the symbols of the multipolar world um, that will supersede, is currently actively superseding the unipolar world, is um, BRICS. So, um, you know, BRICS is, uh, you know, many people, uh, here's, here's a quote from um, one analyst of the BRICS summit where uh, many nations applied to join BRICS and some were accepted uh, the last time around. What's truly shocking is the lack of historical knowledge of many American strategic thinkers. They don't seem to understand that the unipolar moment the U.S. enjoyed for the last 30 years was an aberration. We are now returning to a multipolar world, which will be a much richer world. However, it does mean that the U.S., We'll have to learn to play a much more intelligent game globally. So stay tuned to see if that happens. That is a quote from Kishore Mabubani, who's a Singaporean political scientist um, at the Asia Research Institute. Will the U.S. empire shrink like the Ottoman Empire back to a homeland where it will continue to exert full spectrum dominance, but just on its own citizens? Or will the breakup of the unipolar world and the reordering involved lead to another world war as World War I was the result of the Ottoman Empire uh, breaking up and not being able to dominate the vast area that it had um, control over for hundreds of years? This is an example of soft uh, propaganda that I think is very, very much part of the full spectrum dominance strategy. This is from a book that uh, is published by Scholastic, a corporate um, publisher here in the US that specializes in educational offerings. Um, it's from a book called Diary of a Spider. I have a grandson, a little, a very little grandson who just loves spiders, so I've read this book so many times, but I always really hate this page. Um, these are some fun facts about spiders. Without spiders, insects could uh, take over the world. What has Scholastic chosen to illustrate the concept of take over the world? Well, an insect wearing a business suit and a red tie sitting in front of the seal of the president of the United States flanked by two flags. Um, since when is the president of the United States taken over the world? But again, this is a book from about 10 years ago, and this reflects the kind of hubristic belief in full spectrum dominance and how we sell that to children from the get-go. This book is intended for probably about a second or third grade um, audience. And um, I could go on and on about Scholastic and their huge carrying of water for the uh, military industrial complex, but that is a subject for another webinar. I think in the next couple of years, uh, we're likely to see a huge shift in the center of gravity of world economics um, because uh, full spectrum dominance will be impossible to implement as the reign of the petrodollar comes to an end, which will bring down the practice of the U.S. just 
printing money and selling the debt in order to fund these endless wars. U.S. Treasury bonds are already falling. Um, the, I think we all probably realize that China holds the bulk of U.S. Treasury bonds. And uh, typical of the sort of maturity and carefulness of that culture, uh, Chinese civilization being older by thousands of years than the U.S. and its full spectrum dominance notions, um, they've been divesting slowly and carefully from U.S. Treasury bonds. But the Treasury bonds have been falling steadily for some time now. And <clears throat> when the bottom really falls out of that scheme, I think um, Americans will, will wake up to a harsh economic reality that uh, most of us have not experienced yet. There are lots of other <clears throat> exchanges springing up using other currencies to uh, buy and sell petroleum, for instance. And um, as the U.S. you know, steps up its campaign against China, many analysts are predicting the world, the global South in general, will have no appetite for treating China as an enemy. Um, their economic support of um, many, many infrastructure projects and, um, you know, uh, the, the Brick and Road Initiative is now 10 years old. It has its 10th anniversary this year. Um, and that's an infrastructure project linking the global south with, you know, so many other parts of the globe. Um, what exactly is the U.S. going to offer to, to counteract that? Um, probably not going to be able to. The Congressional Commission on the Strategic Posture of the United States is clueless, though. They're still going with full spectrum dominance. This report just came out this month. Um, and uh, it noted that, you know, in the 2022 National Defense Authorization, uh, it called uh, for increased nuclear weapons production to be able to fight two wars at the same time with Russia and with China. Um, you know, the U.S. hasn't won a war in quite a while. Um, back in 1950, we couldn't win a war with China. I, I, it, it beggars the imagination to think why the Pentagon would think that they could now. Um, and, you know, the industrial capacity of the U.S. has, has been gutted. And, and it is not, infrastructure has not been invested in to really accomplish this. So it's, it's really just kind of a pipe dream. Um, at this point. So what should we do? Well, I think that the imperative is on all of us to do what we're doing tonight, inform ourselves, get together and organize. Many people have seen uh, the news reports that the orcas or killer whales have been attacking uh, rich people's yachts um, in the Mediterranean and in uh, the sea off uh, UK. And um, so, um, you know, online wags are, uh, are you know, have coined the term organized thinking. You know, my husband says, if there were um, aliens coming down, you know, the Pentagon is putting out a lot of, you know, uh, UFO propaganda at this point. He says, don't you think they would contact the whales instead of the humans? If you were a higher form of intelligence, would you really be looking to uh, connect with the humans? Um, which I, I think is a, a, probably a pretty good point. Um, I'll leave you with a quote from Andrew Basevich, uh, the president of the Quincy Institute. The monumental arrogance and ignorance prevailing in the inner circles of power have led Americans to misapprehend their place in the global order. So in other words, it's all hands on deck. And, uh, you know, it's it's good to be with with you people tonight. It, it makes it gives me hope for the future to be with a group such as this one. I did put together a very uh, selected um, sources for some of my information. You can see the Cost of War project there, and uh, maybe Greta can find out a way to share those links with our audience. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lisa. And yeah, if you share the presentation with me, we can certainly include this in the follow-up email along with the recording. So we do have some questions that are coming in in the Q&A box, and 
feel free uh, people to keep putting those questions in. We have about 15 minutes to try to get through as many of these as we can. Um, so the first question from Barbara is, when did full spectrum dominance become US policy? Was that 2015 or earlier? It was earlier. That's a good question. I believe it was 2005 that it first turned up in Pentagon publications, but the 2015 label was sort of like they were projecting out 10 years and saying, here's what it's going to look like in a decade. And a follow-up question from Al, does the U.S. Defense Department actually use the term full-spectrum dominance? Is this documented mm -hmm. somewhere? Or are they still using this term? It, it, they definitely have. Um, are they still using it right now, this minute, today? Uh, they publish so many things and so many communications. I'm not sure I, anyone's qualified to answer that. Um, but yes, it's it's their term and it comes from their literature. Great. All right. The next question here, oh, actually a comment from Greg that I thought was interesting that maybe you want to respond to. Um, Greg says, I don't see how the U.S. can expect to dominate China when one of the leading U.S. war contractors, Raytheon, has said that they cannot build weapons without key parts from China. It's a very good point and could have been another whole presentation is once you are really cooperating globally, economically, and on technology, then you, you're you no longer in a position to say, oh, we don't you know do business with those people anymore. Um, many people have observed that by doing that, the U.S. kind of shot themselves in the foot because China just said, fine, then we'll make our own chips. Okay, if that's what we need to do, we'll do it. Yep. Um, a question here from Greg. Many commentators have noted that as our empire, the U.S. empire, fades out, the risk of U.S. elites going berserk and launching nuclear war or other forms of chaos goes up. What do you think the chances are that we can stop such an ending? The, that the American people could stop such an ending? Nil to none. Our government stopped representing us a long time ago, obviously is not responsible, responsive to what the people want and need. However, I go to sleep at night uh, feeling better that I'm pretty sure, again, that, you know, these threats like China and Russia have the best minds of their um, technology community working on disabling nuclear weapons. That's what I'd be working on if I were them. I did read some reports um, this summer that the, um, uh, the, the Pentagon had detected some um, hacking activity at the uh, in Guam on one of their military bases on Guam, and that uh, they believed it was coming from China, and they believed that it was uh, at first it seemed to just be um, surveilling, you know, figuring just in there to sort of surveil the activity, but that seemed had recently transitioned to disruption rather than surveillance. Thank you. And I want to share, if you haven't seen, there's some great comments coming in in the chat, just thanking you for the presentation, saying excellent presentation. So thank you for everyone for that. Um, let's see, we have a question from Leah who says, who are the people who are pushing for these wars and full spectrum dominance? Is it the military corporations? Is it the petrodollar finance? Who is behind this, basically? Who is uh, the words of Leah here, who is this arrogant and soulless to push for these wars? Well, the, you know, what is it that um, Ray McGovern has this really long acronym for the military, industrial, uh, media, uh, educate universities. Um, you know, he's got the guys. It used to just be the MIC. Now it's this long, long. Um, it's like acronym. the Mickey Matt or something like the that. The Mickey <laughs> Matt. Yes, I think that's right. Um so, you know, I think it's fairly clear that once you've got a guy coming off the board of Raytheon to be the Secretary of Defense, I hate calling it that because it's not defense, but, you know, at that point, and, and Congress, when you enter Congress, even if you're pretty uh, working class or middle class, when you enter, you're a millionaire, you're a multimillionaire by the time you leave because of insider stock trading, mostly in defense stocks. Um, you know, defense stocks are going through the roof constantly. So, you know, 
many people cite Citizens United as being the point at which you could no longer get corporate money out of the uh, government, out of the federal government, um, because the Supreme Court ruled that money was political speech and that corporations were people for the purpose of uh, the First Amendment. Um, but, you know, it's pretty clear that this has been a problem. I, I think Eisenhower warned about the military industrial complex, maybe the year I was born or the year before I was born. It's been a problem for a long time, but it's certainly gotten uh, more and more um, pervasive. And the profit motive is just, you know, once you're making weapons primarily so that somebody can get a fifth yacht, are you really, is that really the military program that would most benefit your nation's self-defense? I'm, I'm gonna argue no. John here asks uh, about the law that you mentioned that Obama passed that legalized the state propaganda targeted at US citizens. Is there evidence that the US military or CIA agents are working as reporters or editors in mainstream media? Uh, I don't know so much working as reporters, but there's strong evidence of their uh, working behind the scenes with the people that are the editors and are the publishers insisting that certain information be suppressed. And, you know, uh, I don't know if any of you have seen this uh, YouTube video that was put together. Uh, I'm probably going to mispronounce his name. It's a young man named Matt Orofela. And he pulls clips from corporate media that where they're all saying the exact talking points, almost in the same tone of voice. But I mean, it's, you know, every corporate left, right and center, Europe, any English speaking uh, nation. And he will pull all these clips. Uh, the mo his most recent one was them saying that the Ukraine war was not about NATO. And it, it's he does a really good job of editing it so that it, it's almost like a symphony of talking heads saying it's not about NATO, it's not about NATO, it's not. So the the control of uh, information uh, sources is um, goes far beyond them being, you know, one reporter. Uh, it's It's more systemic than that at this point, I think. Al Mitty, who is a co former coordinator of the World Beyond War Florida chapter, now coordinator of the World Beyond War Illinois chapter, Al says, in a press conference with Lloyd Austin or Blinken, has anyone asked, how can we move from a policy of full spectrum dominance to full spectrum cooperation? I am not aware if that question has been asked, but I will admit that I do not listen to a lot of press conferences where, you know, <clears throat> the paid... Um, agents of big uh, weapons manufacturers are spouting forth. So not a good person to answer that question. I think maybe that's a challenge for all of us to try to ask that question and, and push for that shift in narrative and policy. Um, and Barbara here asks about the link for the films that you just mentioned. And maybe if you send that to me, Lisa, we can compile that in the follow-up email. I will make sure to put that in the email. Okay, great. Um, all right. A challenging question from Janet here. So Janet, it's a long one. I'll try to summarize this. Um, so basically, Janet's talking about the recent Palestinian offensive into Israel, the Hamas attack, and then quotes a quote from Stokely Carmichael that says, Dr. King's policy was, if you are nonviolent, if you suffer, your opponent will see your suffering and will be moved to change his heart. That's very good. He only made one fall fallacious assumption. In order for nonviolence to work, your opponent must have a conscience. The United States has none. And then Janet says, I will add, Israel has none. Complicated question, perhaps. Um, Lisa, I don't know if you have any responses on that. I would agree with that. I mean, again, it's the, uh, you could do a series of webinars on um, <clears throat> all the nonviolent ways that the Palestinians have tried to um, stand up for their rights. Uh, that I keep thinking of the Great March of Return. The Great March of Return went on for, I think, two years, where every Friday, completely nonviolently, residents of Gaza would, would go up to the fences that were keeping them in, and Israeli snipers would shoot them. And uh, they killed medics that were there treating people that had been shot. They were apparently deliberately told to aim for the legs. Uh, 
when they were doing the shooting. You know, that's one example. The other one that, that went on for much longer uh, is the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. BDS is an entirely nonviolent strategy that Palestinian civil society called on the rest of us to support and help them. And then, uh, you know, how many people have been kicked off, uh, kicked off university faculties for saying that they believed in BDS or been called anti-Semitic because they're, you know, engaging in or promoting BDS? The, the nonviolent attempts that were mm, Dr. Martin Luther King-like were really failed because of exactly the reasons that Janet points out there. The, your, the oppressor has to have a conscience. And in this case, it does not appear that they do. I'll just add um, World Beyond Word just hosted our annual global conference um, last month. And the theme was nonviolent resistance. Uh, and I can put the link in the chat. Um, basically, we had three days of panelists who were sharing their firsthand experiences from all around the world. It was incredibly global with over 30 countries represented and sharing all these examples of using nonviolent resistance in the face of militarized violence, in the face of dictatorships, in the face of occupations. Um, so I encourage anyone who's interested in exploring this question to take a look at the conference website. We have all the recordings from the panels and um, you know, it's talking about how we can be effective uh, using nonviolent resistance and sharing various case studies of that. I'd just like to say that really a general strike is the most effective nonviolent resistance that I can think of to bring down the Mickey mat in this country. It's easy for me to say because I'm retired, but if everyone just stopped going to work for a week or two, the system would crumble quickly. They they wouldn't be able to do much of anything. Uh, certainly, they wouldn't be able to do full spectrum dominance. It's, you know, again, we could go into the reasons why the labor movement hasn't been strong enough to pull that off. But all we have to do is withhold our labor, really. That's, that's all it would really take. Well, we are just under the hour. We made it through all the questions. Again, thank you, Lisa. I'm seeing lots of, again, comments in the chat saying thank you for this very informative presentation and for your answers to all these questions. And I will pass it to Larry if you have any final questions or comments for Lisa to wrap it up. Well, Lisa, uh, <clears throat> that was an excellent presentation and uh, certainly uh, a number of comments uh, have appeared stating uh, the same. Um, Thank you. Uh, there's a uh, Vietnamese uh, lieutenant colonel, former anyway, uh, and I don't know if he was with the Vietnamese army, uh, with the U.S. or with the uh, the Viet with the Northern uh, Vietnam, but his his saying was that in every war. It matters not who won or lost. The people always lose. And we're seeing that in front of our eyes daily. And when are we going to start seeing investments in peace? And it it's just blows my mind because... Uh, what could we accomplish with what we're spending on killing each other? Uh, it's it's just it just blows my mind. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, Lisa, uh, maybe I'll see you tomorrow in Brunswick uh, for the. Uh, maybe you can say what it is. Yeah, we're going to stand uh, in solidarity with Palestine tomorrow in Brunswick, Maine. It's uh, where Bowdoin College is, and we'll be there from 11.30 to 12.30 in the downtown. And um, so, Larry, if you want to join us, that'd be great. Sure. That's only about 18 miles from here. Uh, and the thing that we seek uh, in support of Palestine is to end the, the occupation and to, we're peace seekers. And that's what we want. We, you know, uh, if if people could just work to but there's so much money to be made by uh wars and so on and and 
and and to think that they run out <laughs> it's beyond me so uh you know i think it's uh 3% of the uh military budget or the department of defense uh 3% of that budget could end starvation in the world now how many friends would that make us so uh again uh, lisa thank you so much and Greta, always a pleasure uh, to work with you. <laughs> Indeed, it is a pleasure to work with Greta. Thanks so much for having me, for giving me this opportunity to speak to a, to your audience. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night. Yeah.